online and we're so excited that you've chosen to join us wherever you're watching us from we're asking if you have someone you need to call to join you for this service do that and so this is the fourth sunday of this month and we've been doing an interesting series called how you really doing about mental health issues and today i want to remind you something that the lord is great in battle it doesn't matter the battle you're going through he is strong and he is mighty according to psalm 24 verse 8 and so we're about to do a song that says and we're going to lift this god who's great in battle today are you ready guys all right let's do this
through. Lord, there is no battle we'll go through that you are not aware of. Even when it comes to our minds, oh God, we say that, Lord, be magnified and that we know we are more than victorious in Christ. And even as we go to the next song that says that we belong to you, oh God, that in Galatians 2.20, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so we say, Lord, I belong to you. I belong to you. Take my mind, take my heart, take my body, take everything that I have, oh God, and do as you please. We've been captured by this love that we cannot explain. Oh Lord, your love is unconditional, it's eternal.
through life, so many things come and we even forget who's in control, who's great in battle, oh God. We forget that you are in control, that you formed us and you know us, oh God. And that there's nothing that can separate us from you and your love, oh God. So today as we've been going through the sermon and learning about families and mental health, oh God, we know that we belong to a family. Even if our families are broken, or we don't even have a family, but we belong to your family, oh God. We were bought with a price, oh God, and we belong to you. Heavenly Father, we love you, we adore you, we magnify your name, for there is no one who's like you, oh God. So be magnified in this place. Be magnified in our families, in our homes, oh God. And let nothing take your place. And it's in the name of Jesus we have just praised and worshiped. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. There's a lot that's lined up for you. Enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever it is that you're watching from. My name is Pastor Carol Wanjao, and I'm an executive pastor here at Mavuno Church. And I'm so excited to be bringing God's word to you today. How are you really doing? That's the name of our series this month. And we've all learned, you know, from someone one and three to three, that all of us suffer from some level of emotional or mental imbalance. And this is because of our alienation from God, which comes from our refusal to believe that he exists and that he cares, that he exists and that he cares. And so we seek other ways apart from God to meet our emotional needs. And all these really do leave us empty. And they are the source of all our anxiety and our stress whether it's in, at work or even at relationships. And so over the last three weeks, we've learned how to find rest in God. We've learned how to deal with anxiety and stress in our personal lives and also in our workplace. And today we want to be talking about emotional well-being in our children, which is so, so important. And so as we begin this sermon, I want to start with a question. And that is, which were your most fun memories growing up? Which were they? Uh, I think I can remember for me uh, growing up, I think playing with friends uh, in our area, in our estate. I mean, that was so much fun. I mean, we used to make clothes out of grass and out of flowers, you know, that was really, really fun. I mean, I look back to that and I'm like, that was an amazing childhood. And, and I know from, you know, when we think about it, we normally characterize our childhood as a time of fun, of innocence, of bliss. You know, it's almost the calm before the turbulent years and the roller coaster, you know, uh, co college years. I mean, after childhood, everything just seems to be going down. And in fact, if I were to ask you the same question again, but now about your teen and your college years, you'd remember the fun. But for some of you, the fun would be just a faint flash in the midst of just really dark, stormy clouds. And you see, uh, when it comes to our adolescent years and our college years, they have a way of just bringing to the surface issues that are hidden in childhood. And, and you know, just the cracks in, uh, that are there in those foundational years just seem to come up in our adolescent years and even in our college years. And research, you know, was done that sought to cluster the onset of emotional issues among children and young adults. And this is what they discovered they discovered that many behavioral problems, such as attention deficiency or opposition or defiance or lack of self-control, rage, explosive anger, etc., they begin in the age range of about four to 15 years. And then when it comes to anxiety and fear-related disorders, they start at about five to 17 years, and that is, you know, and that is at the time when kids are actually going to school, when they start going to school. And then we have eating disorders such as bulimia and anorexia. These ones, you'll find them between the ages of 15 to 18 years. And uh, with these eating disorders, they are related to body image. 
you know, uh, people want to look a certain way. And so, you know, they may then, you know, try to manage their weight and they do so uh, <laughs> uh, not in a very good way. And that's how you end up with anorexia or, dis uh, or bulimia. Then we have stress-related disorders. And these ones are now when we are getting into high school, uh, when we are doing exams, you know, between the ages of 15 to 30 years, uh, those are the college years. Those are, that is a time when people are either doing exams, uh, they are students, uh, they are young adults. Um, and so, you know, between 15 and 13, then, you know, there are people who will actually experience a lot of stress at around these years. Then we have the substance abuse, that is alcohol, drugs, uh, addictive behavior, even something like uh, pornography. Uh, I know the statistics mention 19 to 25 years, but I'm like, you know, uh, just from experience, we find that kids, even as young as 13, can get into alcohol, they can get into pornography, and addictions can come earlier than that 19 to 25 years. And then we have, you know, um, uh, the schizophrenia, the psychotic and personality disorders, and those ones begin to appear between ages 20 to 25. You will not see them so much with uh, younger, uh, like teens, but they'll begin to appear at uh, 20 to 25. Now, these are the years when these issues begin, and, and they can last a lifetime if nothing is done to inter intervene. But as I looked at this information, you know, I was a bit shaken, and I asked myself, how really are my children? And if I can be honest, for any parent listening to this, and even if you're not a parent, you can recognize these traits in, in yourself, maybe as, as we were looking at the statistics, you can say, oh my goodness, this is where, when these issues began. Uh, so it can be in yourself, it can be in your, nep in your nieces, in your nephews, and it can be a little bit disconcerting. So if you're ex a parent, you can recognize, for example, that your 10-year-old is defiant, you know, or your 15-year-old has no self-control when it comes to eating, when it comes to handling their gadget, uh, or, you know, you might see that your nephew um, or niece has a drinking or a drug, uh, a drug problem. Now, you'll notice that I have not mentioned any children under 10. And you may ask why. And it's mainly because we still consider for children under 10, their behavior to be, to be cute. And we are quick to give excuses. Now, let me just give an example. I remember witnessing a scene in the supermarket that really disturbed me. I mean, <laughs> it made my ears tingle. You know, I just got hot and flustered all over. And this was uh, a little boy of about four years. Uh, he was with his mom. They were doing shopping. And all was going well. You know, they were just selecting groceries. They were picking things, you know, from shelf to shelf, down the aisles, until they came to pay at the counter. Now, I, I don't know if all supermarkets have conspired, but most of them have all their sweets at the child's eye level. And if this is not enough, sometimes the cashier can take so long uh, with the customer just before, which means the child has all the time to look at the goodies and for ideas to begin formulating in their minds. And so this is exactly what happened to the boy who, uh, who was in front of me and, and, and also to the mom. And the boy and boy did that child let his opinion be known. I mean, the boy fell to the ground. He let out a loud piercing scream, the kind that you cannot in, uh, ignore. Indeed, the whole supermarket came to a standstill. I mean, well, kind of, but suffices to say that you could not ignore that scream. And the poor mom in, the, in, in embarrassment ended up succumbing to this act. And to be very frank, the boy seemed quite a proficient actor. I mean, it, it looked like he had done it before because, and that each time he did it, he got what he wanted. And so he was a pro. What I could not believe, however, is that the mom apologized on his behalf, citing that the boy was tired and needed to sleep. I mean, I could not believe that. Now, I do not know about you, but not many African moms could have withstood this behavior. At least not my mom. I cannot imagine what my mom could have done. Even thinking about it gives me goosebumps. And maybe it's because these moms knew a thing or two about the law of projections. And the law of projections simply superimposes childhood behavior to teenage and young adulthood 
And, and so what it says is that if we have a defiant four-year-old boy or child, they will become an angry and defiant 15-year-old teen who cannot be instructed on anything. And unless God has mercy on such a child, they end up exhibiting deviant behavior, engaging in drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, pornography, if not criminal activities. A lot of times as believers, you know, we, we know this verse, Proverbs 22, verse 6, and it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And as believers, uh, you know, when we read this verse, we assume the child being talked about is being taught godly values. But the power of this verse is that it applies either way. Train up a child in godly ways and they will not depart from it. But train up a child in ungodly ways and they will not depart from it either. So how are you training up your child? What media is influencing your child? Is it the Bible or is it Hollywood? Also, what excuses are you making for their behavior right now? Because listen to me, the behavior you're letting off now through your excuses will grow to become a monster that will bite you um, as a parent and greatly harm your child. So I would say get help. If you've never done LEA, go ahead. It's a, it's a class that is done at Mavuno and it teaches us how to raise children according to godly standards. And so if you haven't done it, I would urge you, go ahead and do it. And let me tell you why, the importance of this. It's because godly parenting is the first level of defense as far as mental wellness in our children is concerned. In fact, if you remember nothing else out of this sermon, please remember that godly parenting is the first level of defense as far as mental wellness in our children is concerned. Now, I want us to step back a little bit and just discuss, you know, just mental health or emotional well-being and the, and the models that are out there because there are different models that are out there that are used to understand mental health and emotional well-being. And these have a direct bearing on the treatment or the solutions that are offered. So we have the medical model and this one tries to understand mental health from a biological perspective. And uh, what this model does is that it will examine genes, you know, genetic codes, are uh, trying to correlate between genes and behavior. Uh, it will also examine the brain structure or the chemicals in the body and try to see the balances. And uh, there they are, they are, they are trying to see the correlation uh, between biology of the body and behavior. Now this is why, you know, you will hear, you know, that there's an addiction gene that was isolated that is common in people, you know, who suffer from, you know, alcoholism or that there are certain chemicals out of balance in people who suffer from depression or schizophrenia. And in this model, the treatment offered usually, you know, involves taking of medicine. And this model is very well known to us because it was one of the earlier ones that were developed in the history of mental health. However, as the profession has matured, other factors that affect mental health started also being realized and, you know, and the people began to see how they come to play. And so nowadays you will find that the social uh, and economic backgrounds of people are, all, are increasingly being considered in the treatment plan. So it's not just biological, but people look at the social, you know, what are the support networks that this person have? What is the economic background that they are coming from that could be uh, contributing towards, you know, the, the mental health issues. But today, I want to introduce us to another, you know, to introduce another angle that is not as well known or even as well understood, and that is mental health from a biblical perspective. And uh, this perspective has very unique distinct distinctives, which I want to draw our attention to, because when we understand mental health from a biblical perspective, then we will begin to see the Bible very, very differently. And so the assumptions that I want to talk about uh, when it comes to the Bible and mental health. Here's the first assumption. The Bible assumes that we all have mental health issues. Now, 
beginning with someone one, we said that because we, we all live past, uh, post Adam and Eve, you know, after their fall, we are all sinners. I mean, look at Romans 3, 23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of the way that we were created and the intention that God had for us when he was creating us. And so God is not shocked. You know, he's not shocked when we have mental health issues. Indeed, it's in our genes we fail. It's part of our nature. So it does not surprise God at all that, um, that, that I can have a defiant four-year-old or that my 15-year-old is addicted to porn and is abusing drugs. It comes at, to no surprise or, or, uh, to him at all. So for me, I'm like, my goodness, if God knows and he understands that it's as a result of the fall, then we can relax. We can be real. I will be the first to admit that as a parent, one of the most shameful things for a parent is to admit that there's something wrong with their child. In fact, as parents, we get so defensive, thinking that we're being judged, thinking that we are failures, especially when people point out things about our children. Now, some of us come from such high shame families that talking about uh, issues, leave alone mental health, it's a taboo. But I'm here to tell you that God is not surprised. God is not surprised. And hiding the fact that you or any of your children have mental health issues does not help at all. If anything, it leads to more pain and to suffering. And that is what the enemy wants, for you to hide, for you to feel ashamed, uh, and to continue suffering uh, the pain. Now, might I add here that we are hypocritical when we point fingers or stigmatize those of us who suffer from mental health issues. Listen to what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians 12, 22 20 to 24, it says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. In other words, that child in the family who's going through issues is indispensable in God's sight. Even if they're going through behavioral issues, they're still indispensable in God's sight. Verse 23, and the parts we consider less honorable, we treat with greater honor. In other words, we pay more attention. We pay special attention. And our presentable parts are treated with special modesty, whereas our presentable parts have no such need. But God has composed the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Because that's the way that God wants us to, to, to behave, uh, you know, when we are working with people who have mental health issues and other issues as well. So there you have it. Greater honor, greater consideration, no place for shame or condemnation, but rather a place to pay special attention for those suffering from mental health issues. And so I want to ask you, how are you? your children doing? How are your siblings doing? How are your nephews and nieces doing? Especially for those of you who do not have children. So that's the first assumption, that all of us have mental health or emotional issues. The second assumption that the Bible makes is that it assumes that some, though not all, of our mental health issues are a result of sin. And I want to be very sensitive as I say this, because you know, there's a brand of Christianity which out of ignorance tends to you know, cast blame on people suffering from mental health issues as being the result of their sin. But the Bible is clear, we all suffer from consequences of sin because we live in a fallen world. You know, Sometimes we suffer because of other people's sin, other times the result of our own choices. Uh, you know, and so pointing a finger or looking down again at those with mental health issues as special sinners is most unfortunate. It should not be happening at all. And so the Bible has no qualms calling out things as they are. It will not call defiance as a disorder, but as sin. It will not call narcissism a personality disorder, but it will call it selfishness, which is a sin. Now, I know 
<laughs> there's some of you listening to this. This is the most politically incorrect, uh, you know, way to put these things. But here's the thing. When we understand these disorders from a biblical perspective, then people are given back hope. Why? Because God is in the business of restoration. He restores people who are broken, who are sinners, and he makes them whole again. I mean, look at Ezekiel 36, 26, and this is God's promise. And he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now, a heart of stone is a hardened heart. It's a cold and caring person. It's a stubborn and repentant. It's a re rebellious heart. Maybe even somebody who's involved in crim criminal activity. You know, and are there such people in their lives, in our lives? And what do we normally think of them? As hopeless, isn't it? Hopeless cases. You know, we normally say, um, this is the way this person is. They steal, they lie, they cheat. There's nothing that we can do about it. But the Bible tells us there is something that God can do. And that's in Ezekiel 36, 26, which we have re just read, which says it is even God himself who's saying he's going to change that heart. Now, I want us to read on verse 27, uh, Ezekiel 36, 27. And it says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances or my commands in some uh, translations. So change of heart or character is something that God does. It is something that God does. And he says, he himself. And he wants us to do it in partnership as parents. And the way that he does that is that he urges us as parents through teaching and discipline. You know, that's the way he changes hearts. The word of God, as we are, you know, sharing with our children, it enters their heart and it changes them. And he holds us responsible to carry out that, this duty. But, and, but even with this, there are only things that God can do. So modern science and therapy is limited. It's limited. I'm not saying it is bad. I'm not saying don't go see your therapist or your psychiatrist. But all I want to say is that it's limited because it sees mental health as a disease that needs medicine. But here God is saying, I will do it. I will remove from you your heart and heart and give you a heart of flesh. And also I will move you to obey me. You know, there are some things that only our creator can do. There are some things that, you know, that we can try, but only our creator can do. And he can only do that when we come out clean and we confess that there is sin. We call it what it is when we call it sin and we say we need help. We need help with our defiant child. We need help with our addicted child. We need help with our child who has criminal inclinations. We need help also for ourselves as parents and even for adults. We need help for our relatives. We need help, period. And God responds to that. And so the Bible, the second assumption that the Bible makes is that our mental health issues are as a result of sin. And when we come out clean, then God is able to do something about it. So that's the second one. The third one, the Bible assumes that some, if not all, and uh, not all, some, not all, of our mental health issues are a result of demonic oppression. And I want us to look at uh, a famous um, a scripture that kind of shows us how this works out. And this is Luke 8, 26. And this is what it says. This is Jesus with his disciples. You know, they sailed to the, re to the region of Gerasanes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. And for a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and, and, and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. 
Now, when we read this, you know, this is extreme. It, it's, it's an example, you know, this example is, it's, it, it kind of just shows the extreme end of demonic oppression. But from my experience, I have discovered that the many common emotional uh, issues that we go through, such as depression or fear, anxiety, rage, so low self-esteem, frustration, stress, lack of confidence, or, you know, a lot of these are a result of demonic oppression. And they are usually resolved through prayer, which is what, you know, we were doing in the first three sermons in the sermon series. However, you know, there are other mood uh, major, they are classified as major mood disorders such as bipolar or schizophrenia or chronic or clinical depression that may be caused by chemical imbalances in the body and, and also maybe even a stressful life, uh, lifestyle or life events and they may therefore require medication in addition to prayer, to professional counseling and to a loving family support. And so if you have a child who has a, a, diagno a diagnosis of these major disorders, you cannot, after these prayers, discontinue use of medication as only your doctor can determine this as they monitor you know, your child's progress. So that is it. Those are, the, the, those are the assumptions that the Bible makes. And with these assumptions just comes a lot of liberty. Because when we call out things the way that the Bible calls them out, then we are able to to, uh, to, to get help from God uh, because he's there and he's willing to help us. Now I want us to conclude by bringing us to a, a place of prayer. And um, as I had said before, you know, when, as we looked at this model, the beauty about understanding mental health from a biblical perspective is that, again, we can enlist God's help and that is what I want us to do. And it means that we can bring the worst or the most desperate situations to God because as our creator, the one who gave us these bodies and created these bodies, they, our bodies do not intimidate him and neither do the issues that we go through intimidate him. And so I want us to pray because we do so with hope. We do so with hope. Um, mental health or emotional issues are not the end of you. They are not the end of your child. They are not the end of your relative. There is hope because God is able to help us. So you might be a, a parent and as you've listened to this someone, you realize that you've been making ex excuses for your child's bad behavior. You know, you recognize that you're not raising them according to godly standards and that their behavior is actually more influenced by Hollywood than, the, than by the Bible. And I want us to, to confess that. I want us to confess that because that is not God's intention. Now you might be a parent or a single person and you too recognize that your behavior is more influenced by Hollywood than the Bible. And you realize that you too need to confess your sin. And I want you to pray and for us to pray together. If you recall, we had said earlier that godly parenting or behavior, godly behavior, is our first line of defense as far as our mental health is concerned. And so it is so important that we get this right. And so I want us to pray in two ways. The first is that we're going to be repenting of our godly ways of raising our children or our ways of living if we're single. We're also going to pray for deliverance. We're going to pray prayers of restoration. And we're also going to make a covenant or rededication of our children back to God. And so these prayers are being projected up. And as we pray, I want you to join me by praying prayers of agreement, by saying amen or by saying yes. Is that okay? Yes. Say yes or amen. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, I confess that I have sinned against you. I, have, I confess that my behavior and that of my children is influenced by the world and not the Bible. I ask you to forgive me for making excuses for my child and even for myself. Amen. I want us now to move to prayers of deliverance. When we confess our sin, God hears. And I want us now to, to move to prayers of deliverance. Again, say amen or yes at the end of the prayers. So Father, I confess that I see ungodly behavior in myself and children. 
I recognize rebellion, defiance, greed, rage, lack of self-control, stubbornness, selfishness, lack of cooperation with others, lack of love for others, pride, lack of teachability, addiction to social media, drugs, alcohol, pornography. I recognize laziness. I can also see that my children suffer from stress. They suffer from anxiety, from fear, from depression. I, I know the ones that suffer from low self-esteem. They are those who are paranoid, who have a manipulative spirit. They, 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 have, they, they do not love you easily. Some do not even want anything uh, godly uh, in their lives. And Father, this is not the way that you created them to live. And I root out these spirits from their presence and also my presence and cast them away to the pit of hell, which is where they belong. And I speak release from Satan's bondage in the mentioned behavioral and emotional pro uh, problems. And I speak cleansing with the blood of Jesus over my children and over their foundations in Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. I love the fact that after we, when we pray for forgiveness, God hears us. I also love the fact that when we pray and we ask God to deliver us, He delivers us. Now the next thing I want us to do is to pray prayers of restoration. It's not enough to pray prayers of, uh, of deliverance, but we always must pray prayers of restoration and restoring our children or even praying of ourselves, restoration over the way things, uh, to come back to the way things intended uh, for, for us to live and to be. And so this is the prayer of restoration. Lord Jesus, I sow into my children's foundation seeds of joy, of love, of patience, of peace, of kindness, of gentleness, of goodness, and self-control. And as I sow these seeds, my prayer by faith is that as they read and as they hear the word of God, these seeds will grow and that my children will experience the fruit of the Spirit. I speak that our children, that over our children, their God-given destiny is restored. I speak that their fruitfulness and success is restored. I speak the ability for them to rule and reign in accordance with your will and purpose over them is restored in Jesus' name. I speak a restoration of renewed love for God, a, re a restoration for renewed love for worship, a restoration for uh, a love for reading God's word. And I also speak a renewed spirit of boldness and courage as our children serve God. And I also speak emotional healing over them. For I pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Now, the last thing that I want us to do is to lead us into a place where we covenant with God and dedicate or give Him back our children. And, and this is very important. And the reason why we're doing this is because we realize that we need His help to raise up this. You know, <laughs> as a parent, and especially when children become teens, the realization that we need help from God becomes even more pronounced. We do really need help in raising God's children. And so as we're handing them back to Him, we're saying, God, only you can deal with the emotional and behavioral problems they are going through. And, and in dedicating them back to God, we're inviting Him to do battles on our children's behalf so that as we carry out our responsibility of raising up, them up in godly ways, we will become more effective. And so if you do not have children or as you are, you are, or, you're, uh, as, or even as a parent, you'd also like to uh, dedicate your life back to God, then you can also make this dedication prayer on your behalf. And when you take your child's birth certificate for anointing, request to also be anointed by the prayer counselor in your church. So we're going to project this uh, statement or this uh, uh, covenant. Um, and so uh, if you're at home, what I want you to do is to just pick up your child's birth certificate because that's what we're going to be uh, anointing this, what we're going to be covenanting, this is like representing your child and we're covenanting them back to God. So we start by, you say your name, I, Carol Wanjao, do hereby covenant and surrender to you, the living God, myself and my children. 
I commit to raising my children according to your word and to conducting myself in godliness. I invite you, Lord, to take over my children's lives and mine as well. Take over and change us from inside out. According to your word in Ezekiel 36, 26, remove from us our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit and move us to obey you. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, to fight our battles for us, for I know that you have overcome the enemy and that with you we are victorious over the behavioral and emotional, emotional problems we are currently facing. I now declare that hardened hearts, behavioral problems, emotional problems are now gone in Jesus' name. And I declare that your character of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control will develop over my children. For the Bible says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And now I embrace my new self and my renewed children in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you at home, will anoint these certificates in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Now, you'll allow me as your pastor to make some final comments as we conclude or before our final blessing. And I know that we have made some pretty bold prayers. And this is because we know that our God is able. He is able. But there is work to be done in order to realize the wins, you know, just the things that we've been talking about and the prayers that we have prayed. And so I want to encourage you again, if you've never done Leah, please register to do so. We did it, for th we've, I've done it three times myself. And so, and it has really made a difference in our lives and the lives of our children. And I want to say that prayers simply remove the hardness in your children's heart, but now you have the hard, to do the hard work of raising them up in godly ways. And Leah is so good in instructing you on how to do so. And so sign up, sign up. And then the second thing is that the prayers we have prayed today for your children, you know, they are the beginning. Transformation is a process and it requires concerted effort and consistency. And so do not be alarmed after we have prayed these things, you know, your children, uh, you know, there are still some things that are still going on in their lives. But Romans 12, 22 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the way that we do this for our children is by exposing them to God's word. So do daily devotions with them. Pray with them. Read the Bible together. Nowadays, there are so many interesting children's Bibles that you can read together with your children. And you know, and you make this a time of fun that everyone looks forward to. You know, create that family devotion time uh, where people can be real, your children can be real. Uh, uh, and this is not comfortable, but hey, you know, this is what it takes. Uh, create that time where they can be real. Uh, create a time where there is care, there is love, there is fun, there is instruction, there is correction, you know? And when you create that kind of an environment, even teens, even young adults in your home will be attracted to that kind of a space. So do that, create a warm, loving environment that allows for these things. Also bring your children to church. Make every effort to ensure that they are involved in some way, whether it's ushering, leading small groups, teaching in a class, or being involved in the worship team, whatever it is. Even if it means incentivizing them, <laughs> you are, do it. Uh, because, you know, there are some who will not naturally buy into the idea of going to church or even enga engaging in church, especially if they are teens. You know, it's not the coolest thing for them to do. So you may have to incentivize them. I'm like, go for it. And again, this is why we're doing it. It is because godly living is our first level of defense as far as mental health and emotional well-being is concerned. And that includes our children as well as ourselves. And so I do not want you to forget that, that godly living is our first line of defense. And so let me bless you with the final prayers. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. 
May he make his face to shine upon you. And may he be gracious to you and to your family. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Self to you, I belong, I belong. 